and welcome to the campus of our university, the public institution of higher learning in and for the nation's capital. A, spe a special welcome to our mayor and her team, especially senior advisor Beverly Perry. Well, let me also introduce uh, the members of our Board of Trustees who are present today. Mr. Barrington Scott, Dr. Anthony Tard, Dr. Charlene Drew Jarvis, Sandra and Kamga, Kamna, the student representative, uh, retired General Errol Schwartz, Jerome Shelton, Dr. Elaine Kreider, Mr. Reggie Felton, Mr. James Dyke, and uh, Dr. Esther Barrett-Zone is not here, but she is represented by her husband, Sam Black. So today is an important day on many levels. We are here to announce the partnership between the district and its university to study the past, support the present, and help shape the future of our unique city. In addition, as the nation's capital, the history and politics of the District of Columbia in many ways reflects the struggles and triumphs of the nation as a whole, so that the impact of this partnership will reach far beyond our borders. The Institute for Policy, Politics, and History will engage students, scholars, and speakers in the ongoing process of understanding and helping to shape a resilient, sustainable, and equitable future for our city, and doing it as a model for the nation. That is an exciting prospect. Housing the Institute at our university, which is itself transforming into a model of urban student success, is not only appropriate, but timely as well. So we thank former Mayor Pratt for the idea. Uh, we thank Beverly Perry for supporting that idea. We thank our Dean Massey of our College of Arts and Sciences for helping to refine the idea. And most importantly, we thank Mayor Bowser for making it a reality. Amen. Mayor Bowser. Well, good morning, everybody. And how about our president, Ronald Mason? Let's give our president a big round of applause. Um, I'm delighted to be at our university, and um, I invite everybody who's watching, if you haven't been to the University of the District of Columbia in a while, um, you're missing something. Um, so find out what's happening at our university and find a way uh, to support it. Uh, and as the president has said, we are here uh, to launch a very important initiative for our city, the launch of the Institute of Politics, Policy, and History at the University of the District of Columbia. I, too, want to um, offer my appreciation for all of the people that you mentioned here at the university that helped make this a reality. Uh, I know, as it was being discussed, we looked at universities around the country uh, to see how they were dealing with the politics and history of their hometowns uh, and making sure that that policy, um, politics, and history was discussed in a scholarly way, um, but in a, a way that was also accessible um, to this generation of Washingtonians and students uh, and to future generations of Washingtonians uh, and students. Uh, and it's always good that we have our living history right here in Washington, D.C. I see uh, Arrington Dixon, who was the first ward for a council member and later chairman of the council. Thank you, Arrington, for, for being here. 
and Charlene Drew Drivers, who was the 20 year Ward 4 council member. Uh, thank you, Charlene. Uh, and now, my representative on the University of the District's um, board. Uh, and uh, we have, and we fail to recognize sometimes, because now we have a number of uh, African American women who run big cities, and I'm proud to be one of them. Not a lot, but there are a few of us. Uh, and sometimes we fail to remember that we had the first African-American woman to run a big city. She was the mayor of Washington, D.C., Sharon Pratt. And uh, Sharon brings with her, of course, a great uh, history and knowledge uh, about our city. Uh, and I cannot wait for her leadership of the, the Institute of Politics and Policy uh, and History here at UDC. Uh, many of you know, uh, in, my, in my inaugural remarks just a few weeks ago, I called on the university, the business community, and DC leaders to affirm a path to UDC's ascendance as a first choice two year and four year institution for the best of the brightest right here in Washington, DC. I was proud to share the stage with our at large council member, Anita Bonds, uh, and also the presence of our good friend, Senator Michael Brown. Please appreciate and acknowledge them as well. With this Institute of Politics and Policy, uh, we know we are stepping into a key um, link to that ascendance, uh, connecting the history of our city with all of the good work um, that goes on here at the university. The institute will engage a new generation of leaders and prepare them for careers in public service. And what's more, it will showcase the unique history of Washington, D.C., establish platforms for making our local history more accessible uh, to those who have lived here for generations and those uh, who are learning about our city just now. It's fitting that the Institute will be uh, led by our former mayor, Sharon Pratt. Mayor Pratt uh, was elected right around the time uh, that I was going off to college. I was a young Washingtonian getting ready to find my place in the world to study history and to later study policy um, and to later practice politics. So in many ways, this institute is the perfect intersection of my life uh, and many people like me. Sharon was elected 30 years ago, and since that time, um, we have seen uh, so many things change in cities around the nation uh, and change in cities like ours. Still too few women lead big cities. The numbers for African American and, um, and Latina women are even uh, worse. And another issue that hasn't changed since the 90s um, is that we still don't have statehood for Washington, D.C. And both of these issues, underrepresentation in politics and the need for more people to know the history of our city, is why this institute is so important. Uh, Sharon, uh, everybody will remember, uh, has been one of our most outspoken uh, leaders for statehood for Washington, D.C., calling on us to be collectively agitated. Uh, and she is right. We have even more disenfranchised people now uh, than when she was mayor. Uh, and I'm going to add on to what Mayor Pratt has said and say that in addition to being collectively agitated, we must also be collectively informed and committed uh, to achieving uh, full representation and statehood for, for our city. And that is what this institute uh, will do. So we should all be very proud of the progress we see around us and among the students of the University of the District of Columbia, but we must be collectively challenged uh, to make sure more Washingtonians are participating um, in the progress that is Washington, recognize UDC's um, place and responsibility in moving us all forward, and congratulate 
um, the Institute on this day. Now, I am also uh, told uh, that Mayor Pratt had a nice birthday yesterday. Um, and so in addition uh, to launching uh, this, important, uh, this important institute, we want to celebrate uh, her remarkable uh, birth in our city, uh, in evolution in our city. And I get to declare things, as you know. Uh, and I declare today, January 31st, 2019, Mayor Sharon Pratt Day in the District of Columbia. So with that, I invite the Honorable Sharon Pratt to the podium. That is so very nice. I so appreciate that. Um, when the mayor was talking about uh, where she was when I was elected, I thought she was going to say nursery school, but I, <laughs> thank God it was college. <laughs> um, I am so honored that President Mason and, of course, our mayor, Muriel Bowser, uh, permitted me to have the honor of being a part of this wonderful institute of politics, policy, and history. Uh, and I'm going to introduce the people who are going to help to make it happen, including all of you in this audience uh, here today. Uh, but just to put it in context, I just want to say that there was, for ever since we had home rule, some notion about having an institute here. Uh, and actually, uh, the mayor introduced Arrington Dixon. He, when he was a part of that home rule government, a first elected home rule government, sort of began the concept, notion of it, with Mayor Walter Washington. Four years later, he got elected chairman, was able to marshal more votes. Pat Elwood was on that institute. Mm -hmm. uh, and with the support of Mayor Marion Barry, there was an institute of district affairs for about a decade here at the state university, the University of the District of Columbia. Now, for whatever reason, that sort of uh, didn't happen after a while, and there were many permutations of it that tried to evolve since then. But finally, last year, Charlene Drew Jarvis sort of reignited it when she came to President Mason, uh, who immediately said, now, you know, this is a good idea, uh, the notion of inspiring a new generation to be involved in the practice of politics and policy, but we're, really it took life when Mayor Bowser intervened. That's when it took life. Her commitment, and that's a fact. She has an incredible commitment to celebrating and preserving the history of our city, and I so appreciate that about her. Uh, and of course she had a great lieutenant in Beverly Perry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so. Uh, that is how this day happened. That's what brought it about, was that energy, her commitment, the president's commitment, uh, so that we do something that creates a platform that rediscovers, that unearths the history of our city so that it is intriguing and accessible to contemporary audiences, particularly engaging our students uh, in that process. You know, we are a such a unique uh, city. Uh, almost no other place had a city that didn't even exist at the time of the founding of the country. It wasn't even a, a town. It was, uh, some say, a swamp. I mean, it was really, the, the whole deal, you'll see when you, the website is up, by the way, uh, www.ipbh, Arlene, I'm going to get it right, dot org. <laughs> And you'll see a picture of Alexander Hamilton. Now, we didn't put him up there just to appeal to the hip-hop crowd. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you'll see Alexander Hamilton was desperately trying to get the founding fathers at the inception of the country to pick up the tab for the cost of the Revolutionary War. Now, you, as you know, almost all the Southern founding fathers really didn't want a strong central government, so they didn't want a strong central bank. And of course, they didn't have the same experience with the cost. Most of the war was fought in New York. And so New York had been devastated by the Revolutionary War. So he knew that if they were going to have a solid country, they had to take on the debt of those states. 
He wanted, because you should remember, George Washington had the oath of office administered in New York, which was sort of the natural venue, just like in London, uh, for Great Britain. Uh, But the founding fathers, Madison and Jefferson, they had a meeting at Jefferson's house, I think, in New York, and it was there the deal was cut. I know uh, Michael and others are going to get there all this records. It was Maryland and Virginia. Um, The deal was cut that they, those founding fathers would agree to assuming the debt of the Revolutionary War through this central bank if the new capital would be in a slave-holding community. That was the deal. And so George Washington, the ultimate surveyor, got land ceded from Maryland and Virginia in order to create this new city, not too far from, understandably, Mount Vernon. That's how it came about. So we are in such a unique city in the sense that we are an expression of both the aspirations of America, but also many of the issues that have plagued the country in terms of achieving, as the mayor said on our website, that more perfect union. And we at this institute want to unearth that history, explore that history, and have that history illuminate our conversations around some of the touchstone issues that challenge our nation today. We do have quite a few touchstone issues uh, uh, today. So I really want to thank everybody for being here, but I also want to acknowledge the people who helped to make uh, this day a reality. And of course, I want to introduce the team, Jody Samuda, who's here, Amy Anthony, who's here, and our great volunteer senior advisor, uh, Gretchen Wharton, who's here. And I also want to thank uh, President Mason's team. They have been just incredible. Uh, And Lee, who got all of this done, uh, and John, uh, of course, and Mary Ann French has been volunteering time, and uh, Troy, uh, and Patrick Gutsman, I'm going to remember it all, and and Monica, and Marie, all of you, thank you. But uh, folks, what was really going to drive us now, we're going to become a standalone, self-sufficient institute just like they have at Georgetown, Harvard, and elsewhere. Uh, And our task is to initiate programs so that we can attract the support that we deserve to make it that self-sustaining institute. Uh, And to do that, we need a powerful team that will drive us and guide us. And to that end, I'd like to introduce the members of the Senior Advisory Committee. I'm going to end with the two co-chairs because they're going to come up and and make remarks. Now, four of the new members of the Senior Advisory uh, Committee are not here, one of whom is conducting a hearing, and that's the chairman of the District of Columbia Council, Phil Mendelson. And we are very honored that he agreed to serve. Uh, We're delighted about that. I, have, I make notes. I got a D in handwriting, so I can't uh, read it too well. <laughs> but uh, also, um, Dr. James Good has also agreed to serve on the Senior Advisory Committee. He's the real deal. He's a member of the Society of Cincinnati. You know, that was George Washington was their first president. Uh, he was the curator for the Smithsonian Castle. Uh, he is uh, the curator for many other uh, me- uh, ga- uh, of collections, including the Albert Small uh, collect, Washingtonian collection. Uh, and we are very honored uh, that he, too, uh, is a part of, of, of our groups. Uh, Sonia Gutierrez is also a part of the Senior Advisory Committee. She could not be here today. She had been in Puerto Rico and got sick returning. Uh, but Sonia is uh, truly a, quite a personality in the history of this city. Uh, If you go to uh, Wikipedia and look up the Latino community in Washington, they have two names, really, only two big names. One is because she's so famous, Sonia Sotomayor, and uh, I I know I put the emphasis in the wrong place, and then Sonia Gutierrez. So we're delighted uh, (laughs) uh, that uh, Sonia is a part of it. We also have Associate Professor Amanda Huron, who has spent most of her focus on neighborhoods of Washington, D.C., And so she's also a part of it. Now, uh, the president mentioned another person who has been the one who sort of guides me, keeps me on track, makes certain that anything we do at this institute has synergy with the mission and the purpose of the university and serves our student body. And I can't thank her enough, and that's Dean April Massey. She has just been terrific. 
uh, the person without whom so much wouldn't happen. Um, she's been an advisor and counselor uh, to me and to others over the years, whatever the task, whether it was around the arena of politics or another power center, they, they, they worked on electricity. But uh, <laughs> she has been terrific, and that is Beverly Perry. The person who got it going again, who talked to President Mason, she herself is sort of a walking uh, profile of historic Washington, not because of age, but because of her co <laughs> historic <laughs> connections, uh, and that is Charlene Drew Jarvis. <laughs> when you think of UDC, at least for I, when I think of UDC, I think of many people. This other one, though, was always the one who kept it real, came after us if we got it wrong. He, he was always a voice for change and advancement, and he's brought it with such sophistication, such maturity. I mean, we are so very proud of him, and he is now a part of our senior advisory committee, Mark Thompson. I'm going to mention both of them, and then I'm going to ask uh, one of them first, and then, the, uh, uh, then Michael, and then Karen, uh, who are the co-chairs of the Senior Advisory Committee. Uh, Michael, uh, though we know, think of him uh, as, the, of course, we think of him a lot because he's on MSNBC <laughs> explaining a lot to us. <laughs> uh, he was the former lieutenant governor of the great state of Maryland, without whom uh, D.C. would not exist. Um, <laughs> He was also the chairman of the Republican National Committee. He's a regular contributor at the, well, MSNBC, and he does a brilliant job. But what many of you may not know, Joe Yeldell was the first one to bring it to my attention. Uh, he grew up in D.C. He grew up in the Petworth community of D.C. And when he ha has Thanksgiving dinner, he has it in D.C. <laughs> And then the other co-chair, who's been a friend, advisor to me for, the mayor gave the number of years, <laughs> um, uh, uh, she uh, has served as a deputy chief of staff to President Clinton. I remember when I knocked on her door in, in, on Michigan Avenue, she said, I'm not into politics, she really got into it soon, <laughs> soon thereafter. Uh, she was uh, chief of staff for Andy Stern with SEIU. I mean, she has, she, when President Clinton retired from office, she went with him up to Harlem to be his chief of staff there. She's had an incredibly successful international consulting practice, started her own foundation, Global Fairness Initiative, and a great friend, Karen Tramontano. So to sort of close it out, I'm going to ask these who are now the true leaders of our Institute of Politics, Policy, and History, to come up and explain why they agreed to do this. <laughs> Michael Steele and then Karen Tramontano. Well, well, well. What's up? How's everybody doing? This is an incredibly good day. Cold. <laughs> it's cold. Incredibly good and important day for the University of the District of Columbia. Uh, it is such an honor for me. Um, on so many levels, uh, in a very, very personal way, having grown up in Washington, up in Petworth. My parents are still there, so yes, Thanksgiving uh, at mom and dad's, and they are huge fans of the mayor. I told the mayor, I told my parents I was coming to see him. My dad especially was like, tell the mayor I said hello. <laughs> so, but um, this is uh, unique uh, in so many ways because we are living in a time where, as all of us know, we are, if you're not, I don't know what you're taking, but most of us are exhausted. Uh, and we're exhausted uh, of the politics. We're exhausted of, of the crazy noise that we're engaged in every day. So it is profoundly important for institutions like the University of the District of Columbia uh, to take time to help us collect our thoughts, to re-energize ourselves, to refocus on our destiny. And when the mayor called uh, and asked uh, that I be a part of this, uh, I was flabbergasted, uh, number one. Um, it's like, okay, so it, you need a Republican, right? Is that what this? No, that wasn't it. Um, 
What you wanted was someone, uh, and I think you, you see that from the people who are part of the advisory committee and certainly with Mayor Bowser's uh, leadership and commitment uh, at the forefront of this, uh, someone who would stay committed to and be a part of and pushing the vision of this institution. Uh, as Lieutenant Governor of Maryland, working uh, as I have with our educational institutions at all levels, from preschool all the way through to the university level, I have a profound appreciation for what it takes to educate a child, a profound appreciation of what it takes for that child to then go out into the world and make something of that education. So those forces are very, very important. And this institution is no less important in that regard. Uh, and so this opportunity to come here and to be a part of this national conversation, uh, I thank you, uh, Mayor Pratt, for that. And I thank you, Mayor Bowser, uh, for signing off on her asking me to do this. Because uh, we know that doesn't happen unless the mayor says, yeah, OK, that's good. Um, but the one thing that struck me about this, and, and I, I really don't want folks to lose sight of it, we do politics here in D.C. extraordinarily well, right? We do. And my buddy Jim Dyke taught me a lot of lessons in that regard over the years. We do politics very well. We do policy very well. We know our stuff, right? And we put that out on the street and we, you know, try to teach the world about the nuances of health care and transportation and all of that. But history, history is the thing that connects all of those dots. And to have an institute that is focused on history, that's focused on not just where you're from, but seeing that as the road map of, map of where you need to go and how you're going to do what you're going to do in the future, that to me was important. This city is profoundly important, as the mayor noted, in the history of not just the region. Yes, you got a little bit of Maryland and a little bit of Virginia. But the nation, no, the world. The stuff that happens here, that comes out of the neighborhoods of Washington, D.C., neighborhoods like mine, Petworth, where I grew up, is the stuff not just of the moment, but the stuff that makes the future. You have members of Congress, United States Senate, ambassadors, dignitaries, very important people with long titles, living in our neighborhoods, raising their families, having their kids educated by the DC public school system. And yet that history is lost, is lost on so many people around the world, and especially in our own country, when it comes to what Washington DC means to this nation. So as the lieutenant governor, former lieutenant governor of Maryland, as the former RNC chairman, and the one, just quick side note, Mayor, I'm sure you appreciate, it, appreciate this, the best title in this town to have is former. So <laughs> just, just so you know, trust me. Yeah, yeah, you, you frown now, but. <laughs> but, the, but the important thing is understanding the history, understanding the history and bringing that alive and making it alive for this and future generations. This institute is going to play an important role in that. It's going to be an important role in the conversation of this nation, in sharing the legacies of families and communities that are grown up right here, right here, and then, then spread out across the globe. And that footprint, that imprimatur, is going to be the symbol that you see here. IPPH is going to be a part of that. And that's what drew me in. And that's what excites me about this opportunity, to share my history as a native Washingtonian and to integrate that into the history of future generations and to help guide and support this institute uh, and to support the leadership and the legacy of this mayor because it's important. And to help this president connect the dots for this and future generations of students. So thank you all very, very much. And it's an honor to be a part of this. Uh, and all of us will be knocking on your doors for checks soon. So <laughs> just letting you know. <laughs>
so for those of you who have uh, been in the position of <clears throat> the last person speaking, let me tell you what it feels like to follow a mayor, a former mayor, and then a former <laughs> lieutenant governor. Um, I will be very, very brief. Um, I am honored to, uh, to be a part um, and to answer Sharon's question. There's two reasons uh, why I said yes. Uh, one is I was Sharon's former chief of staff, and for any of you in the audience who knows what it's like to be a chief of staff to anybody, you are always the chief of staff. Um, and so you, there's no option. Uh, <laughs> the answer was yes. Um, but much more importantly, uh, 40 years ago this year, I moved to the District of Columbia. I'm obviously not a native Washingtonian. But 10 years after I was here, um, I began my, my career working with Sharon um, as her chief of staff. And an entire world opened up to me. The world of government, uh, the world of policy, what it takes to not only be a political candidate, but what it takes to be in government and governing. And there is a huge, huge difference between those two, as I know the mayor knows. Um, but most importantly, what it was to be in a city that was a majority African-American city, the struggles, the mentality of Congress to us. This was an experience I never had growing up, even in the smallest state of the nation. I grew up in Rhode Island, and we only had a few more people than the district had, but we were treated way differently by everybody. It was an eye-opener, and I learned so much under Sharon's tutelage and and then went on, as Sharon said, to um, continue career in private sector and then in government serving uh, President Clinton. But my second big reason for being here is giving back. I would not be where I, were, I am today uh, if it weren't for the District of Columbia, um, if it weren't for the experiences that I had being Sharon's chief of staff and going on, working with the people in the District of Columbia in every ward, uh, working with ANC commissioners, city council, then on in with the, doing, I wouldn't say working with Congress at the time, doing battle with Congress at the time for four straight years. So um, I am honored to give back and I'm honored to serve and thank you very much. And I just want to echo one thing that Michael said, we will be back to you for your support in many ways and especially financial. So thank you. Well, I want to thank everyone um, for your, um, your presence here today. I want to uh, just congratulate you again, Mayor, on pulling together a wonderful advisory committee um, that is going to ensure a very successful policy institute. Uh, and to you, Mr. President, keep doing what you're doing. Keep pushing hard for the residents of the District of Columbia. Uh, and I know we're all here to help. Thank you very much. We now return to our previously scheduled program, already in progress. Show you that it's a difficult path for a woman that chooses technology. It has a lot of stop signs, it has a lot of challenges, it has a lot of moments that you think, why am I doing this if this is so hard? There's a 